And my name is Ben Rossman. I'm an associate professor of computer science at Duke University. I work in theoretical computer science, uh, in particular the area of circuit complexity, which studies computation and combinatorial models such as Boolean circuits. Uh, I became excited about this area in grad school when I first saw how the techniques used to prove circuit lower bounds uh, could also be used to answer questions arising in mathematical logic, in particular questions about the expressive power of first order logic on finite structures. Uh, this is an area known as finite model theory, which I have been interested in. And there are many nice connections with circuit complexity. Circuit complexity also gives a concrete combinatorial approach to understanding the big open questions like P versus NP. Uh, and in this lecture, I'll give an overview of this field and especially how computation by circuits relates to the Turing machine model that you have encountered in previous lectures. Basics of circuit complexity. Okay, so in circuit complexity, the uh, main objects of study are Boolean functions and Boolean circuits. A Boolean function is a function f from the hypercube 0, 1 to the n, so the set of n bit strings to 0, 1. Uh, a running example will be the n bit parity function denoted xor sub n. So on a string x, the parity function outputs the number of ones in x mod two. In other words, the sum of the coordinates x1 to xn mod two. So um, the model of computation that we study for computing Boolean functions um, are Boolean circuits. Uh, so you see here a circuit depicted on the right. Um, circuit is comprised of and or and not gates. Um, and the inputs are just the coordinates of the, uh, of the uh, string. So um, the way we would formally define a Boolean circuit uh, is as follows. So uh, as a finite acyclic directed graph um, in which each input is labeled by, by a variable, each gate is either not and or. Let me start over because this sucked. Sucks. Basics of circuit complexity. So the central objects of study in circuit complexity are Boolean functions and Boolean circuits. A Boolean function is a function from the hypercube, so the set of n bit strings to 0, 1. And a running example. Um, in this lecture will be the n bit parity function denoted x or sub n. This maps a string x to the parity of the number of ones in x. So the sum of coordinates x1 to xn modulo two. So Boolean circuits are the model we study for computing Boolean functions. Um, the way we formally define a Boolean circuit is as follows. So it's a finite acyclic directed graph whose inputs are labeled by the, the coordinates of the input string. Um, and each gate in the circuit is either a not gate within degree one or an and or an or gate within degree two. And there's a unique output uh, gate at the top, uh, which is producing the function that the circuit computes. So a circuit with n input variables computes a Boolean function of n variables. Uh, in the natural way. And the two parameters we'll consider of Boolean circuits uh, are the size and depth. So size, we measure by the number of gates and the depth is the maximum number of gates on an input to output path. So for example, uh, this circuit here has depth five. And just as a note, sometimes uh, we, measure size and depth only in terms of and and or gates. So sometimes it's convenient to, to ignore uh, not gates. In other words, let them count for free. Okay, so this is the Boolean circuits computing Boolean functions. Let's look at some examples. So let's start with the two bit parity function. In other words, the exclusive or function on two bits. We can compute this as follows. Uh, so this circuit says either x1 is zero and x2 is one, or 
x1 is 1 and x2 is 0. So this is clearly computing the uh, ex exclusive OR of x1 and x2. Let's say we wanted to uh, build the 4-bit parity function. Well, then we could make a separate copy of this circuit over x3 and x4, and then another copy on top, taking these, these, these two uh, XORs as, as inputs. Uh, and in this way, we get a circuit computing the 4-bit parity function. OK, we can generalize this construction to any n. And we get circuits computing parity uh, of size order n. And depth would be order log n if you, uh, if you build these circuits up in a balanced way. And in fact, you can check for yourself that uh, in total, you'll get 3n minus 3 and an OR gates uh, and depth uh, 2 log n uh, plus order 1. And it turns out you can show that both bounds are tight. And we'll, we'll actually discuss this uh, later on. OK, so um, and or not, uh, so it, it turns out you can compute any Boolean function with just these three gates. And so we say that the set and or not is a universal basis. So the term basis refers to the set of functions that are available as gates in, in a circuit. Um, so uh, as an exercise, you can convince yourself that if we, even if we just have and and not gates, so if we don't have or gates, then still we can compute all Boolean functions. Uh, this is essentially follows from De Morgan's law that expresses or in terms of and and not. Um, even if we just have a single binary NAND gate computing the not and function on two variables, that by itself is a universal basis. Um, two non-examples are just the set of and and or gates. So if I don't allow you negations, um, that's known as the monotone basis. Um, and just a single uh, uh, binary XOR gate is also not a universal basis. And it's a, it's a um, good exercise, perhaps, if you haven't seen this before, to characterize the classes of Boolean functions that are computable by circuits in these bases. OK, so Boolean circuits uh, give us a way of measuring the complexity of Boolean functions. OK, um, we could measure this by size or depth, but uh, here's the definition of the circuit size of Boolean function. This just refers to the minimum size of any Boolean circuit that computes that function. And um, this is uh, up to a constant factor. This is notion of circuit size is sort of independent of the choice of a, of a finite universal basis. So the, the observation is that for any finite universal basis B, so set of possible gates, the B circuit size of F is within a constant factor of its Boolean circuit size. And to see this, you would simply replace each gate of, of the basis B with an equivalent constant size Boolean subcircuit. OK, so let's, uh, let's uh, make a quantitative version of this claim that every Boolean function is computable by a Boolean circuit. Uh, so in fact, we'll show that an n variable Boolean function is computable by a circuit of size at most order 2 to the n. OK. So let's see how, how, how we can show this. So it's going to be a proof by induction on n. So consider the two n minus 1 variable Boolean functions, f0 and f1, where f sub b is obtained by substituting the constant b for the variable xn. And we're going to define an, uh, a circuit c sub f computing f. Uh, as follows. So assume we have circuits CF0 and CF1, then C of F will be the circuit as follows. It's the, we're saying either XN is one and CF1 is, is one or not XN. So XN is zero and CF0 is one. Okay, so uh, if you just think for a moment, you see that this, uh, this circuit indeed defines the function 
uh, computes the function f. And, uh, and clearly the number of gates in the circuit C sub f um, is, well, we have all, we have the gates from CF1, we have the gates coming from the subcircuit CF0. And then in addition, we have four extra gates, this or, and, and, and not. Okay, and then by induction, it follows that the number of gates in C of F will actually equal uh, this, this, uh, this number here, which is order two to the N. Okay, so this is one way of showing that every Boolean function has at most exponential circuit size. And uh, this actually a stronger upper bound is known. It was shown by Lupinov, I believe in 58, 1958 that uh, you can actually uh, construct circuits of size order two to the n divided by n. So slightly smaller, and that's, that's uh, uh, by, by a more, more clever construction. And that turns out to be tight. Okay, so we're next going to see one of the earliest uh, results in circuit complexity uh, proved by Claude Shannon in 1949. Okay, so, uh, almost all Boolean functions, and for concreteness, let's just say more than 99% of Boolean functions on n variables require exponential circuit size. In particular, have circuit size at least omega of two to the n over n. And the proof is very simple. It really, it, it, it's a, just a counting argument. So on the one hand, there are two to the two to the n, uh, distinct Boolean functions. And to see this, note that there are two to the n points in the Hamming cube. And to specify a Boolean function, you just, you, for each of those uh, points in the hypercube, you're assigning it zero or one. So there are exactly two to the two to the n distinct Boolean functions. But on the other hand, um, I claim that there are at most this number, s plus n to the order s, inequivalent circuits of any size s. Uh, so here we're really counting the number of distinct Boolean functions that are computable by size s. And it's an easy exercise to show that you can bound this by, by essentially s to the 2s. Okay, and the reason for two here is because for each and or or gate, you know, it has wires to, uh, to, to two different subcircuits. Okay, so won't give the details of that argument, but once we have this, uh, this claim in hand, then the theorem follows immediately. Um, it follows that to compute even 1% of all Boolean functions, well, then we require that, that the number of inequivalent circuits of, of, si uh, of the given size is at least 1% of two to the two to the n. So we would need this inequality, but this means that the size s uh, has to be omega of two to the n over n. All right, so that's very simple proof, which establishes that almost all Boolean functions have exponential circuit, uh, circuit size. Okay, next we're going to define a complexity class associated with circuits. So this is known as P slash poly, okay? So it's gonna be, this is, this is the circuit or, or so-called non-uniform version of P. As, as I'll explain. So, um, so, so far in this, in this uh, online lecture series, we've been studying the complexity of languages, right? So a language L is just a set of strings of arbitrary lengths. So zero one to the N is zero one stars, just notation for string, you know, all, all strings of zeros and ones. Um, so we can identify a language L with a sequence of Boolean functions, okay? <laughs> Namely, the, the, the nth function in the sequence is just the characteristic function of the language on inputs of length n, right? So fn of x, in other words, equals one if x is in the language L and zero otherwise. And this is a one-to-one -one correspondence between languages and sequences of Boolean functions. Okay, so this lets us study the complexity of a language in terms of circuits. And here there's a, an important distinction in, that we make in, in complexity theory between uh, uniform 
and non-uniform models of computation. So, so far you've encountered already various uniform models of computation. For instance, a single Turing machine, which decides membership in a language L for inputs of arbitrary length. So if, for any Turing machine, you can run that Turing machine on inputs of any length. Similarly, a deterministic finite automaton would be another example of a, a uniform uh, model of computation. Non-uniform uh, refers to uh, having a sequence of, of models, uh, you know, circuits, say, um, you know, one for each input length. Um, so to compute a language L non-uniformly, we have just a sequence of circuits where CN is deciding membership in the language, but only uh, can be run on inputs of length N. So um, when we speak about algorithms in the traditional sense, usually we have in mind uniform models of computation. In particular, in a uniform model, in, you know, a, a single Turing machine or you know, algorithm has a, a finite description that you can write down. So in contrast, an arbitrary sequence of circuits mm, does not necessarily have any finite description. Okay, so we don't make any assumption about how the sequence is being generated. Okay, so let's, let's just recall uh, what we've shown so far about Boolean functions, but in terms of languages. So to recap what we showed earlier, every language L viewed as a sequence of Boolean functions um, is decidable by some sequence of uh, exponential size circuits. And then uh, we showed Shannon's theorem that almost all languages, on the other hand, in fact, require uh, exponential circuit size. So this leads us to the definition of the class P slash poly. So this is the class of languages that are decidable by polynomial size circuits. Okay, so, so much less than the, than, than, than the, the, the worst possible exponential circuit size. Okay, so, so in other words, languages with efficient circuits. Um, and just to reiterate the point, we, here we make no assumption about the process that generates these circuits C and, and in fact, the sequence of circuits can even be uncomputable. Moreover, P slash poly, you can easily show, even contains undecidable languages. Okay, you could, you can sort of hardwire an undecidable language into this, this sequence of circuits. Okay, so um, now we're going to show that P, so the class of polynomial time uh, decidable languages is a subclass of P slash poly. Okay, so the circuits are actually a more powerful generalization of Turing machines in some sense. And, uh, and so this follows from the following theorem that uh, any Turing machine M with running Okay, here's an illustration of the construction. And these diagrams are copied from Sipser's book. So the idea is based on what's known as the tableau of the Turing machine M uh, on a given input X. So this, the tableau uh, over here on the left is a table, a T by T table. And each row uh, of the table contains a, the configuration of the Turing machine at the given time. So on the top row is the initial configuration of the Turing machine. Then the next row would be the configuration after one time step and so on. So the configuration contains the contents of the tape uh, together with the location of the tape head and the current state. So initially, we, the first N cells will contain the, the input X uh, followed by blank symbols out to, out to out to column T, T of N. And the, the, the first cell will contain also the state, the initial state Q0, indicating that the tape head is, is at the leftmost location in, in, in its initial state. Okay, and so the, the, you know, for example, if the first step of the Turing machine were to overwrite this with a one and then move to the, move the tape head to the right, then the next configuration would have one, zero, one, zero, and, and in the second cell, we'd additionally have whatever the, the state is at that point. 
uh, good. And we can assume without loss of generality that the Turing machine uh, always halts with the head in the leftmost position. So therefore to determine whether or not uh, the, the machine accepts, it suffices to look in the contents of the leftmost cell, you know, the bottom left cell. Now, um, so the, the idea of the circuits which simulate the, this, this uh, tableau is as follows. So each cell in the tableau, we can represent the information in that cell using a constant number of bits. Okay, so we'll have a constant number of gates which are, which are computing the, you know, like a, a zero one representation of the tape of the uh, information in that cell. And um, so what is the information in that cell? We have the symbol of the tape alphabet. We have, you know, a bit indicating whether or not the tape head is, is at that location. And we have the, 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 cur the current state of the Turing machine in the case that the head is at that location. So um, the observation is that, well, we only need a constant number of bits to represent that information. In particular, uh, log of the size of the tape alphabet plus log of the number of states is sufficient. And now, if we look at any cell in the tableau, so this cell here, for, for instance, um, we can observe that the contents of that cell are completely determined by the contents of the three cells above it, right? So if the Turing machine head at, at the given, at the previous time step is not in one of these three locations, then we know that we just copy for the, 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 the entry above, right? Um, and otherwise it's just a local computation. And so uh, in, in, the, in our circuit, you know, the circuit will be divided into blocks corresponding to the cells of the tableau. Maybe at the top, you have the gates which are representing the actual data there. And then to compute, to compute that data from the cells above, you can do this with constant size Boolean circuits. And here I note that this, in this uh, circuit illustration here, the, uh, the, uh, the wires are being drawn like uh, pointing downwards. In the rest of this lecture, I'm drawing my circuits the other way with wires pointing up. But anyway, you, you get the idea. So this is just a sketch of how this simulation uh, works, right? And we can see that the, the size of the resulting circuits uh, is t, t of n squared. Uh, I wanted to mention that a more efficient simulation is in fact known. So, um, so there exists circuits of size uh, t log t, which simulate a time t Turing machine. So to uh, just to outline uh, how that goes. So the first step is to convert any Turing machine M into uh, what's known as an oblivious Turing machine M prime with running, prime, running time t prime equals t log t. And oblivious means that the sequence of left to right head movements of M prime is a, a function of the input length alone. So on any two uh, strings of the same length, the, if you, or if you're only looking at the sequence of head movements of M prime, uh, they will be the same. Uh, okay, good. So let's take that, uh, that step for granted. That's a theorem of Fisher and Pippinger. Then the second step, which I leave as an exercise, uh, is to convert M prime, uh, you know, the oblivious Turing machine M prime, to a sequence of equivalent circuits of size order t prime. Okay, so there's a there's a linear size simulation of oblivious Turing machines. Okay, good. So we've now defined the class P slash poly, and we've proved that it contains the class P. Uh, so next, I'm going to describe uh, alternative characterizations of both of these complexity classes. So both P and P slash poly can be characterized both in terms of Turing machines and in terms of circuits. Um, so we'll def think we'll define uh, this one first. So, uh, okay, so this is the notion of a Turing machine with advice. So um, let alpha be a function from natural numbers to strings. So we can also think of alpha as just a sequence of strings. 
Um, so a Turing machine with advice alpha is defined as a two tape Turing machine with one standard you know, input work tape and a second tape, which is uh, initialized to the string alpha n on inputs of length n. Okay, so this is a Turing machine with advice. Um, and so the, the theorem uh, is that a language is in p slash poly if and only if there exists an advice function such that L is computed on all inputs by a Turing machine uh, with advice alpha. And just a remark here that without loss of generality, we can assume that alpha has polynomial length, alpha n has length poly n, simply because a poly time Turing machine can only access poly n bits of the advice string alpha. Okay, and um, Right, so I leave I leave the proof of this as a as an exercise, and uh, did want to mention that this is uh, the uh, the standard definition, in fact, of p slash poly. Um, so this theorem is really showing that this definition is equivalent to the one we gave in terms of poly size circuits. Good. So the, uh, we can also characterize the class P, so poly time. Uh, languages in terms of circuits. And this is via the notion of uniform circuits. So here's the definition. We say that a sequence of polynomial size circuits is uniform if there exists a polynomial time uh, Turing machine G, so a circuit generating Turing machine, such that on input one to the N, so a string of ones of length N, G outputs a description of the nth circuit. Okay, so description as some poly length string under any reasonable encoding. Okay, so this is the notion of uniform. So, so earlier we were saying, you know, in the definition of p slash poly, this sequence could be any, you know, sequence of circuits. Uh, to say that it's uniform means that there's a poly time process which is producing this, these circuits. Okay, and then, um, so the theorem is that a language is in P, if and only if it's recognized by a uniform sequence of poli size circuits. Um, so the proof of this, uh, so one direction we essentially already saw the proof of, if you just uh, consider this, uh, this simulation of, the, of a time T Turing machine by circuits of size T squared, well, we'll see, you see that that is in fact a, a uniform sequence of circuits. Uh, you know, the, the, that process we described, you can regard that as a, as a poly time algorithm. Um, in the opposite direction, suppose we have a uniform sequence of poly size circuits generated by some Turing machine G, then we get a poly time language by uh, on input X, we first run the machine G on one to the N where n is the, the length of x. This produces some circuit Cn, and then we simulate that circuit, uh, which can be done by, by, by also by, by a poly time Turing machine. Each of these steps is polynomial time. So, so this produces a poly time um, uh, algorithm for, for our language. And just to mention that there's even weaker notions of uniformity, which, which lead to the equivalent definition of p slash poly, or sorry, of, of p. So you can even take g to be a log space Turing machine. So this is known as log space uniformity. Okay, so uh, to recap, we've now seen uh, definitions of both p and p slash poly in terms of Turing machines and circuits. Um, and, and yeah, so we've seen that p is a subclass of p slash poly. So the question arises, where does NP fit into this picture? Um, so, uh, well, of course, NP contains P. Uh, on the other hand, it does not contain P slash poly. Uh, so as mentioned earlier, P slash poly even contains undecidable languages, whereas certainly every language in P or NP is decidable. Um, that's one way of showing it. You can also show, argue that P and NP are countable languages. They're countably infinite, uh, as are the, the, you know, the class of decidable languages, uh, whereas the class P slash poly is uncountable. 
Okay. Um, what about, you know, so, so we know that P slash poly is not contained in NP, but what about the, the, the converse? So is NP a subclass of P slash poly? Well, we can observe that if P equals NP, then indeed NP is a subclass of P slash poly. And the contrapositive is that if NP is not contained in P slash poly. So in other words, if NP languages, you know, do not have uh, poly size circuits, uh, then P is different from NP. Okay, so, um, so this, this leads to the observation that circuit lower bounds uh, are a concrete combinatorial way of potentially separating P from NP. So we saw that almost all Boolean functions require exponential size circuits. Uh, but proving lower bounds for any specific Boolean function would have great consequences. And, and just to restate what, you know, what, what we would just observe, if any language in NP, um, for instance, satisfiability, in fact, without loss of generality, you could consider any NP complete problem. So if any language in NP uh, has super polynomial circuit size, okay, so larger than omega n to the c for every constant c, well, that shows that NP is not contained in P slash poly and therefore P not equal to NP. Okay, so this is, this is you know, one of the reasons to study circuit complexity is that, is that it provides a combinatorial version of this P versus NP problem. Um, and, you know, we, we can hope to, you know, to, 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 to study uh, these important questions from that perspective. And so this is, this is uh, as I said, the holy grail of circuit complexity to prove a super polynomial lower bound on the circuit size of any explicit sequence of Boolean functions. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, proving lower bounds is hard. And this is illustrated, I think, by uh, considering the sequence of, uh, of, of world records so of the strongest known lower bounds for explicit Boolean functions, here measured in terms of the number of AND and OR gates in Boolean circuits. And as you can see, progress on lower bounds has been very, uh, very slow. Um, and currently, uh, the strongest lower bound known is just shy of 5n. Okay, so we have merely linear lower bounds, whereas we need a super polynomial lower bound to resolve big open questions. Um, you, uh, people have also considered circuits in the uh, so-called full binary basis. So if we allow all binary Boolean functions as gates in a circuit, this is a more powerful model than just Boolean circuits. So the lower bounds are even weaker. And as you can see, yeah, we progress is similarly slow. There was recently, in fact, a breakthrough improving longstanding 3n lower bound uh, to 3 plus 1 over 86. Uh, but I, I, I think this well illustrates the, the, uh, the, the, the challenge of proving circuit lower bounds. So next, I, I wanted to say something about uh, the, the technique that's used to prove these lower bounds. This is known as the gate elimination method. Okay, and, and uh, the idea is, is pretty simple. So we we want to prove a lower bound on circuit size. So let's say a, a linear lower bound of the form C times N for some constant C. Um, so suppose we could do the following. Uh, we could repeatedly pick some variable XI and, and assign it to either zero or one in a way that eliminates uh, at least C gates from our circuit each time we do this. So let me, illustrate what I, what, the, what I mean. So here, consider the variable x2. And suppose we substitute 1 for x2. And let's see how this simplifies the circuit. So consider this AND gate. We have a 1 feeding into an AND gate. But this means that the, the gate only depends, therefore, on its other argument. So this lets us uh, uh, eliminate this wire. And now, uh, we have this OR gate, so we have a 1 feeding into an OR gate. So that means that the OR gate will produce the value 1, no matter what its other argument is. 
so we can eliminate that gate and, and propagate this, this, this one. And now we have a one feeding into two AND gates. So as we saw, we can eliminate those wires and we can perform additional simplifications. We have these three gates here, which receive only one wire. So this means that we can bypass those gates and just put wires directly like this. We could even notice now we have two uh, negation gates and therefore they cancel each other. So just by some local simplification process, we reduced our circuit to this form. And so here, here you can see the gates that we've eliminated. So in this case, we've eliminated six gates. Um, and right, so assuming you could do this, eliminate at least C gates, you know, for at least a, a constant fraction of the time, this would give you some, some, some bound, lower bound, uh, you know, say CN if you could always do this. And uh, I'll leave it as an exercise to show that, you know, using this exact method, you can prove a tight lower bound of three N minus three on the number of AND and OR gates in any Boolean circuit computing the parity function. So we already saw earlier that this three N minus three is an upper bound. And you can prove that this is exactly tight using, using this, this, uh, this um, simple argument. Okay, so this is the gate elimination technique. Um, and let's, yeah, let's recap what we've seen so far. So we've defined Boolean functions and Boolean circuits. And we prove Shannon's theorem that almost all Boolean functions require exponential circuit size. We've defined the class P slash poly, both in terms of Turing machines, uh, circuits, and in terms of Turing machines with advice. And we've given a proof that P is contained in P slash poly via this quadratic simulation of Turing machines by circuits. Um, and we discussed the holy grail of circuit complexity, which is to prove a super polynomial lower bound on the circuit size of explicit Boolean functions. And this would imply P not equal to NP. Uh, and, you know, we, we uh, had a look at the history of of lower bounds known to date, so far merely linear, and we gave a sketch of a gate elimination method which can be used to prove some of these lower bounds. Uh, so next, let's have a look at some of the other computational resources of Turing machines on the one hand and circuits on the other hand. So in the setting of Turing machines, we study uh, time complexity, space complexity, randomness, uh, and for Boolean circuits, we've already discussed size. We defined, but haven't yet discussed depth as a resource. You could also look at width of Boolean circuits. So if we have a Boolean circuit where the gates are arranged in layers with wires going from one layer to the next, then the width would be the maximum number of gates on any layer. And we saw that time complexity on Turing machines corresponds to circuit size. So space complexity turns out to correspond in a similar way to circuit width um, and analogous to definition of P slash poly, there's the you know, class log space slash poly. Um, and this uh, turns out to be equivalent to the class of languages recognized by polynomial size log width circuits. Um, just to mention, um, in, many of the classes we study in circuit complexity turn out to have equivalent characterizations, you know, many different equivalent characterizations. In the case of log space slash poly, this is also the class of languages recognized by polynomial size branching programs. So I'm not gonna define branching programs, but if you've seen decision trees before, then branching programs are like a circuit version of decision trees. So randomness is an interesting resource in the setting of Turing machines and the setting of uniform complexity theory. It turns out that uh, in the setting of non-uniform Boolean circuits, randomness does not increase their power. So you can show that P slash poly equals BPP slash poly, so in the non-uniform setting. And I'll give a very quick sketch of how the proof of that result 
goes. So, so let's just show that you know uniform BPP, which the class that you've encountered so far, so randomized uh, poly, poly time algorithms, is, is is contained in P slash poly poly size circuits. So you can also think of this result as saying that non-uniformity is more powerful than randomness. So here's a sketch of 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 the proof. So consider a, a language L in the class BPP. So this means that there exists a randomized polytime algorithm A that decides membership in L uh, and it gives the correct uh, output with probability at least two thirds on any, you know, for any uh, X. So now we're going to de uh, define another polytime algorithm A prime, which is simply to run the algorithm A some order n times uh, and output the majority answer. Uh, so, yeah, so I'll put the majority answer. And one can easily show using the Chernoff bound that A prime is correct with probability at least one minus one over two to the n. Okay, so we can take a, a some, some, you know, error one third, and we can reduce it all the way down to exponentially small error by just repeating the 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 randomized experiment some order n times with independent randomness each time. Okay, so this is still a polytime uh, randomized algorithm, and now by the magic of the probabilistic method, it follows that there exists some choice of the random seed for this algorithm a prime such that A prime is correct on all inputs. So because the number of inputs is two to the N and we've reduced the error probability down to below one over two to the N, it follows that there's some choice of the random seed for which this algorithm is correct on all inputs of length N. Great, so uh, now it, it follows immediately that this L is therefore computable by a polynomial time Turing machine with this advice string alpha, right? You just simply run, run A prime with alpha playing the role of the randomness. And therefore by our characterization of P slash poly in terms of poly time Turing machines with advice, this shows that L is in P slash poly. Okay, so this is the proof that non-uniformity is more powerful than randomness. So uh, finally, we come to the very interesting resource of Boolean circuits, which is the depth. So recall that the depth of the circuit is the, the, you know, the length of the longest path from an input to the output gate. And this, this measure corresponds uh, to parallel time. So it corresponds to time for, for par, you know, parallel algorithms with multiple processors. But it's also tightly connected to another complexity measure uh, called formula size. So let me now define for you what are formulas. So formulas are simply circuits, Boolean circuits with the structure of a tree. Okay, meaning each gate has, or each node in the formula has out degree one. Okay, so this means that it will have the structure of a tree. Whereas in a general circuit, you can have a gate which feeds its result to multiple gates above it. And you can think of formulas as, as being a memoryless model of computation in the sense that the result of each sub computation gets used only once. So each gate only feeds its answer you know, to, to one gate above it. And you know, intuitively, this should mean that formulas are a weak model of computation. Um, so um, this correspondence between circuit depth and formula size is made concrete by the following theorem. So uh, first, every circuit of depth D is equivalent to a formula of size at most two to the D. Okay, and we'll, we'll see the proof of this in a moment. And then the more interesting direction, every formula of size S is equivalent to a formula of depth order log s. Okay, and therefore by, by part one, the, the size will be s two to the order log s, so s 
to some constant. Okay, so in other words, this is saying that with a polynomial blow up in size, we can balance a formula so that it has depth, which is just logarithmic. And I'm going to illustrate the proof, sort of proof, give a proof by picture of both parts of this theorem. So for part one, um, well, if we're just going to convert a circuit to a formula in the obvious way. So for each gate in the circuit, if, if it has, you know, has, takes two subcircuits that feed into it, we just make disjoint copies of those subcircuits. And then we repeat this process. So start at the root, starting at the root, you do this, and then repeat this process inside of the red triangle and the, and the, and, and the, and the yellow subcircuit. Okay, and you do this all the way down. And it's easy to show that the, that the uh, formula size that you get is at most two to the D. Okay, so for the other direction, we, we're going to start off with a formula of size S and we're going to show how we can convert it to a formula of depth order log S. So here, consider this orange formula of size S. So the first step is to, to we're gonna split this formula. We're gonna find some edge, some wire that is in this formula. Uh, you know, where if you remove that wire, you'd split the formula into two sub formulas, each of size, you know, between one third S and two thirds S. So the claim is, in other words, that there exists some sub formula of the orange formula whose size is between one third and two thirds S. And to see, to see this, it's very easy. You just, uh, so a formula after all is a binary tree, a rooted binary tree. So start at the top and we're going to consider a walk down the formula where at each point you descend to the, to the larger of the two sub formulas uh, below you. And the claim is that, well, at some point we have to pass, we have to reach a subformula of size between one third S and two thirds S. And this is simply because each time we descend, the, we're reducing the size by at least one half, right? And, and, and therefore we, it's impossible to pass from size above uh, two thirds S to below one third S. Okay, so we, we, we find such a, a sub formula like this. And then we do the following uh, transformation. So consider the following formula. I, uh, what I've done here is I've taken two copies of the, of the yellow sub formula and then two copies of the red sub formula where here I'm substituting one for the yellow sub formula and here I'm substituting zero. And I claim that this formula on the right it computes the same Boolean function as the formula on the left. And okay, so this is easy to see if we just sort of verbalize what is this formula doing? It's saying either the yellow sub formula evaluates to one and this red sub formula with one substituted evaluates to one. Uh, or the yellow sub formula evaluates to zero and the red sub formula with zero substituted evaluates to one, right? So, so this equals one if and only if this, this guy equals one. Okay, and then, so, so we've transformed this, you know, we started off with this orange uh, formula and we've, we've uh, transformed it so it has this form. And then we're going to recurse. We're just gonna do the same balancing process uh, in each of these four subformulas. And since, this, since each of these four subformulas has size at most two thirds S, this means that this recursion only has depth order log S. And when you think about the resulting formula, this means that the, you note that we're increasing the depth by, by just three each time, right? So the, the, the final formula we, we get in this way uh, will have depth order log S. Okay, so that's, this is the, the, the theorem we just showed. And this leads to the following defin, definition slash corollary. So the class, the complexity class of languages decidable by log depth circuits, so circuits of depth order log n, this is known as NC1. And as a corollary of the theorem, 
this class is equivalent to languages with poly size formulas, um, right? So to see why, uh, so every log depth circuit is equivalent to a poly size formula by part one. And every poly size formula is equivalent to a log depth formula by part two. And every depth two formulas, uh, sorry, and, and, and since formulas are, are, are circuits, this, this shows that poly size formulas are equivalent to log depth circuits. And it moreover follows that this class NC1 is a subclass of P slash poly uh, because poly size formulas are a subclass of poly size circuits. Okay, so now we have these two different size notions for Boolean functions. We have circuit size and formula size. And clearly circuit size of a Boolean function is at most the minimum formula size, right? Because I mean, the smallest formula for F is also a circuit. So that, that provides an upper bound on the smallest circuit size of F. So therefore, I mean, it follows that proving lower bounds for formulas uh, is necessarily an easier task than, than for circuits. So we saw that proving circuit lower bounds is hard. The best lower bounds that are known are merely linear. What about formulas? So it turns out that even formula lower bounds are hard. And here, here's the history of the strongest known formula size lower bounds for explicit Boolean functions. So this is a this problem has been studied for a long time, and there's, you know, there was a very gradual sequence of improvements. But for over 20 years, the strongest lower bounds have been stuck at just shy of cubic. So there was recently some low order improvement in, inside of this little one by Abhishek Tal a few years ago. But this is one of the major frontiers in complexity theory to prove lower bounds better than uh, better than n cubed. And this is also another holy grail problem in circuit complexity to prove a super polynomial lower bound on the formula size of explicit Boolean functions. And as we saw, so this, this would show that NP is not contained in the class NC1. Okay, so this is a, would be a weaker result than NP not, in, not contained in P slash poly, but something which necessarily we would need to show first. Um, and right, and, and as, a, as a consequence of the theorem we just saw, this is equivalent to showing a super logarithmic lower bound on circuit depth. So a lower bound better than C log n for any constant C. So uh, this is the last so slide. Just to conclude, I wanted to mention some of the other uh, uh, complexity classes that are studied in, in circuit complexity in the non-uniform setting. So we've already discussed some of these. We have P slash poly, which is poly size circuits. NC1 is log depth circuits. Uh, it turns out that's contained in this class log space slash poly, log width poly size circuits. Um, and and, and that is contained in NC, which is poly log depth circuits. And this is sort of the non-uniform version of uh, of efficient parallel algorithms. So algorithms running in polylog time on polynomially many processors. Um, and within NC1, so a very weak class uh, that, that's often studied is known as AC0. This is constant depth circuits where we allow uh, AND and OR gates to have unbounded in degree. Okay, and this is, uh, this class is sufficiently weak that there are techniques to prove strong lower bounds. In particular, it's known that the, the classic result in circuit complexity shows that the parity function, uh, which is computable in NC1, is not computable in AC0. And you can read more about, uh, ah, so yes, yeah, so before giving the references, just to recap what, what, we, what we showed uh, in this last part, we discussed the different resources of circuits and Turing machines. Right, uh, we, we saw this connection between circuit size and time complexity. We mentioned that circuit width corresponds to space complexity. And this notion of circuit depth we showed is, a, is within a constant factor of log of formula size. And this gives the definition of the class NC1. 
We also showed that non-uniformity is a more powerful resource than randomness. So in a non-uniform setting, every randomized algorithm can be made deterministic. And finally, we discussed the important open problem of proving uh, super polynomial lower bounds on formula size. This is the conjecture that NP is not contained in NC1 and the, 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 the even stronger uh, conjecture that NC1 is different from P slash poly. Yes, and you can read more about, uh, about circuit complexity. Uh, and Sipster's book uh, contains a few relevant sections. There's also the Aurora Barak book. Uh, and a uh, more, more advanced and more, uh, more comprehensive uh, textbook by Yukna, Complexity of Boolean Functions.